Sure. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Hill. Now, for those of you that don't know who this awesome human being is, you're about to get to know more about him, his work, and everything that he's doing in the world. But Simon is the founder of the hugely popular podcast and blog called Plant Proof. Uh, he is a nutritionist and qualified physiotherapist. One on top of his formal education as well, Simon spends hours and hours deciphering, I had to practice that word a little bit there, uh, <laughs> scientific studies so he can break down how to fuel your body to promote longevity and reduce the chance of developing disease while simultaneously, another word I've got to practice, achieving whatever health and fitness goals you may have. He is the plant-based food contributor to Chris Hemsworth uh, Fitness App Center. And in 2019, Simon also operated and opened a plant-based restaurant called Eden in Bondi, which I highly encourage you guys to go over there. Food's great. You wouldn't know it's actually vegan. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, but you've got a new book out, man, which is called uh, The Proof is in the Plants, which is a great book to read for anyone lo that loves silence, science, sorry, that loves food, education, the whole bit. Go and get a copy now. You've got a massive audience anyway. It's far bigger, far superior than mine. But Simon, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today, man? Thank you, Jay. You're you're a humble man. And and uh, yeah, as, as we were talking about just earlier, I'm very honored to see the book sitting up on your shelf next to, to Matthew McConaughey's green light. So that's nice to see and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, mate. Thank you so much for making the time, man. The book has to be there and it's going to be there for a while. I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> I usually, like I was telling you before, I usually put up my favorite books and um, Matthew McConaughey's has been there for since January. So you might be beating his for a while. So there you go. <laughs> That's well, me, I will. I will check back in just like people check in on the, the New York times bestseller list. I think this will, this will be the list that I keep an eye on. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but man, the first question that I sort of want to start off this conversation with is a question that I ask all my guests at the very start, which is what does success look like for you? I'm glad that you asked that. I like these questions because they, they force us to think about, ideas and things that perhaps we don't often take the time to stop and reflect on. And, you know, Jay, I would say that my, my definition or idea of success today is, is different to what it was 10 to 15 years ago. And on a, on a fundamental level today, success for me is about being happy with my life and who I am and what I stand for and what I think of myself, not what others think of me, but, but when the dust settles and I'm by myself, how do I feel about myself? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I say that that's changed for me a lot. And, and I think a big part of that is becoming more self-aware as I've got a bit older. And these days I do take, I take the time to, to sort of check in with myself daily. I know that may sound a little odd, and, and, and woo woo to some people listening, but, and it would have years ago for me, but, but I do stop and, and breathe and try and quieten everything and just ask myself that basic question of how am I feeling? And, mm -hmm. and I can say that thankfully, whether it's a, a result of doing that or just a result of becoming more mature, I can say that, you know, I'm almost always feeling very grateful, very fulfilled and very happy today, mm -hmm. but it wasn't always that way. In my early 20s, I I fell into that trap of chasing money. And for my age, I I was making an incredible amount of money very quickly. And the tangible things in life, they came in. They were I was flooded with these things. The car, the the trophy girlfriend, the the house, but at the same time, I was not giving attention to the intangible parts of our lives that, that, that really do make our existence special. All of those things like the purpose and our spirit and our values, they all took a backseat and I was on autopilot and, and there's nothing wrong with 
chasing money and having aspiration. I want to make that clear. But but what was happening was I was living out of alignment with my core values and and I was absorbed in that material part of the world. So success to me today is about staying aligned. And whether it's New York Times bestseller or making money or accolades, those are really nice things to occur and to experience or aspire to. But I'm at a place where those need to come as a result of acting in accordance with my values, not against them. Mm. I love that answer, man. And you're right. Like those, those things, they do matter to an extent. They satisfy for a short period of time, but they're not fulfilling. They just, it's like, what's the next thing? And I've always been fascinated by, you know, being in alignment, what that actually means and how can people that might be quite out of alignment at the moment return back to alignment and fulfillment and all the the joy that life has to bring. Yeah. And, and I think there are some questions. A, a big, a big part of that though, is finding the space to quieten, quieten all the noise around because a huge part of that in, in that I believe in terms of knowing, are you aligned or not other than, you know, often you can kind of, what I had in my early twenties was just this feeling of, Hey, I'm, I'm, from an outside point of view, I'm doing everything right and, and experiencing sort of success, but something just doesn't feel right. And, and actually in my early twenties, I felt that all the time, but I couldn't put my finger on what was it. And, mm. and now I know it was that I wasn't acting in accordance with my values and beliefs, but at that time I wasn't able to actually get quiet and I didn't know myself. You know, I, I really had no idea of who I was. And and when I was able to actually become more self-aware and start to get down to those core values of, um, you know, commitment to others and helping other people be happier and um, caring and compassion and these types of, of, of very the fundamental parts of being a human, right? Um, but I was never thinking about them. And, and so when I was able to drill down on what those were, I could then identify, well, hey, I need to make sure that the more my actions in my daily practice, whatever they are, whether it's what I'm doing with my friends or what am I doing in business, they are reflecting those core values and beliefs. For me, that's what alignment is. It's, it's, it's are we acting in, 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 in the same way uh, as, as what our values and beliefs are? Is, is that reflective of those values or, and beliefs or is it is it contradictory? And I think most of us, there's always, and, and I can, I'm not doing this perfectly today, there's still this internal dialogue that I always have and I'm trying to always just step closer to those values and beliefs and bridge that gap between my actions and and what those are. And um, so I do. You know, I want to clarify that by no means have I perfected that, but but daily getting quiet, daily just taking that five minutes to breathe and think has been something that's enabled me to to really decipher what those are and and then you know try and make changes in my life that that help me act more in accordance with them. I'm glad you mentioned perfect because you do have a part in your book where you talk about removing the perfection. It's towards the very end of the book. Uh, which is a very important last set, a last you know ending note because there's no such thing as being perfect. I think each and every one of us are on this journey of life trying to figure it out. No one has got it all figured out. We're all learning from each other, and I love learning from people like you, Simon, that has you know got a lot more experience than what I do. And you're still struggling, like I'm still struggling. And I'm probably, I'm a lot younger than you are. So it's always helpful for me and people, people that are listening to hear that those people that actually do have quite more success, hey, they're still, they're still human too. They're still going on this life <laughs> and doing the best that they can with it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, what degree of success you have to the outside world you're right. None of us are, are perfect. And we, we all experience the same emotions, fear and happiness and doubt and judgment. And, 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 and that's, you know, that's, that's one of the amazing things of these conversations like this is so that other people can, can understand that they're not alone in, 
in the way that they're thinking or things that are happening to them in their life. And, um, you know, it's the beautiful thing about human connection, being able to trade stories and trade insights and, and then hopefully just, just being able to, to help someone, you know, find that, that sort of better version of themselves where they're happier and, and healthier and, and just feeling better about life. Absolutely, man. What has been for you one of the most vulnerable moments that taught you the most about yourself? Jeez, you're you're here with the the big questions today. I like it. <laughs> I am, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, what, I've I've always been quite confident as a a speaker, but more in a podcast environment, one-on-one. And I've, you know, I've always struggled with the idea of talking to big groups. And, and I think that's quite common. Uh, but for me, I can be super confident in a small setting and I know that I know my material and I can really deliver some value. But as soon as there's a bigger audience, the, the heart rate goes up and the doubt, the doubt comes in. And for me, it's always been the case. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said today, even still today, speaking to, I'm, I'm more uncomfortable speaking to a large group than I am to, to, to a smaller one. And, um, you know, I'm okay acknowledging that. Uh, but over the last few years, I've done quite a few larger style presentations. And uh, I had one in China and this was organized through a, a sort of third party. They wanted someone to come and talk about nutrition and health. Mm. And I, I've done quite a bit of work on preparing for these sorts of events in terms of, again, not the content, more the mental aspect and breathing techniques and really just trying to get up on the stage and forget the crowd and remove that pressure. I think for me, what happens is there's more people in the crowd. So the amount of judgment that, that I sort of consider is like compounded. And, and so I, I did this, this talk or I signed up to do this talk. And I, I have to say, you know, for many years there, I actually turned down a lot of talking opportunities wow. and, and I did that just pure, there was fear. It was fear. And, uh, I, you know, my dad taught me very early that, and this comes back to what you were just saying about we're all experiencing the same things, is that fear is part of being human. And if we are going to, to grow, it's important that we're, we're, we're within reason happy to step into that fear. Mm-hmm. And to to uh, to understand that that stepping into that fear is not always a bad thing, and a lot of times that's where we grow and and learn more about ourselves. And so I realized that I needed to start taking these speaking engagements at some level if I was ever going to be more confident in in, in that setting. And this this one in China came up. I didn't realize how big it was going to be when I turned up. There was six thousand people there. And, and I remember I I sort of walked in, I also had this thing where I don't want to turn up too early because turning up early, you're sitting around waiting, you're listening to the speaker before you, you start judging, am I going to be as good as them? Am I as inspiring as motivating? Can I hold their engagement? Uh, All of those sorts of questions. I just didn't want to creep in. I didn't want to get into that mindset. And so I, I turned up a little bit early, about 30 minutes and uh, I walked in and I thought I was in the wrong place. There was so many people and it was so loud. Uh, and there was about four big screens. So there was nowhere to hide for the presenter and there was a spotlight and there was, there was just an, a, an enormous amount of energy in the room. And I thought, wow, what have I got myself into here? And I went and, and did the, the only thing that I'd really been taught in that situation was to, to go and get some silence, get away from it, do some breathing and just, just remind myself that uh, I was going up on stage to talk about many things that, that people in the crowd would have been hearing for the first time. They're going to be inspired and amazed by it, no matter what 
bring bring some energy and some excitement and and enjoy the experience and uh you know i got up and 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 i felt very vulnerable i felt on the stage like i was naked and and that everyone was i was completely exposed on all of these screens and there was there was a, as i said nowhere to hide and uh you know, my heart was racing but i you know i i managed through some of those breathing uh techniques that i was doing i managed to slow things down and and you know the first couple of minutes were were slightly nerve-wracking but i settled into it and uh after a few crowd laughs and and some cheering um it became a really really enjoyable and exciting uh experience for me and and i walked away with that not having mastered talking in front of big crowds by any means but um with a whole lot more confidence for for doing it again have you done anything like that since i have and and it's funny uh I, I now i've got this idea that i look quite like the big ones and 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 i don't like the the ones where it's about 50 or 100 people because then it's much more intimate and everyone's a lot closer to you and you're more connected with each person in the room so uh yeah i seem to have have removed fear of the big ones and uh the 50 to 100 uh sort of person audience is still a work in progress it's just, it's just shifted. <laughs> yeah, it's um, shifted. And, uh, you know, it could take a, a, another five, 10 years for me to feel completely comfortable up there. Uh, but we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. And, um, you know, I certainly am not going to shy away from that. And uh, I can kind of accept that that is a, is a weakness of mine that I would love to turn into a strength. I'm going to be vulnerable with you for a moment because I appreciate you being vulnerable enough with me to share that. Because in some ways I can relate because uh, I never thought that I'd be doing this in the first place. And my very first couple of podcast episodes were shocking. And sometimes like when I am doing these one-on-one -on -one interview style, just having a general uh, conversation, sometimes I'll get lost <laughs> and I'll start going off on this long tangent and I won't make too much sense. And my guests sometimes will have to bring me back. They'll like have to help me. And that's a vulnerable moment for me because I, I don't want that to happen. I want to, you know, be more articulate with my words and I want to make sense. And I want the audience not to, you know, I kind of think it's a little bit of pride in a way. Like I want the audience to sort of come away and say, oh, Jay's a great speaker too. You know, he, he, he nailed that one. But really, that's just not the case all the time. You know, I've had some great conversations. I've had some bad ones. Um, but all of which, every conversation that I've ever done, I've realized one important thing is that when we do get vulnerable, when we do share the parts of our story that, you know, sometimes we may be ashamed of, that's how people can connect with you and say, hey, I've had moments like that too. It's all right. It's all good. We can move on Absolutely. from that. So thank you for sharing that, man. You know, uh, I, I get a lot of people asking me about how to start a podcast and, and, you know, one of my first things I say to them is to just start, yep. you know, which, which is the hardest part. And, and there, that's where the most fear is. And that goes with many things is just taking that first step, right? And you're right, like, you know, I, I have my own podcast and we're not always going to be on our A game as, as hosts. And, and uh, there's this saying that I like to come back to, and this, uh, you know, might sound like it's, it's to do with sport, but it really is to do with anything that we pursue in our life. Mm. It's, it's not win or lose. It's win or learn. And so if you're not, if you're not feeling like you're winning, you're at least still walking away with valuable lessons to learn from, you know, whether it's a podcast you walk out of and you think, gosh, I wasn't, I wasn't that great today. You know, you can at least reflect on that and think about, well, okay, what could I possibly learn from that so I can do better next time? Same as every time I get up on the stage and I get feedback from people you know, something that's important for me is to, to actually ask for a valuable feedback, not just what I did well, where do you think I could improve? And, uh, you know, I think that's a valuable learning for people. Mm. Have you ever had a guest on your show that doesn't agree with 
the science-based research that you've put together, all the things that you have actually worked on really hard to present to people? And like, what have you done with that, that challenging conversation if you've had, it, had one of those? I haven't had someone on who's like completely disagreed with everything that I've had to say, that's for sure. Uh, but I do tend to have people on who are very evidence-based and understand the evidence hierarchy and, 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 you know, I know who they are and they know who I am and, and we're either put in touch from, from mutual friends or, or whatnot, but certainly there are, there are nuances and little points of contention and I love that. I love that, that, you know, the thing with nutrition science is that I always say is it's not black and white and there is a little bit of gray and there is some nuance in there. And I love discussing that. And, and where I think that that can be misinterpreted is people saying, well, we have no idea about what healthy eating looks like. Look at all the headlines they are always different. Uh, you know, it's not black and white, it's all gray. You know, nobody has any idea. Look at all the conflicting opinions out there. And, uh, you know, I'm slightly digressing here, I guess, from your, your initial question. Um, but even though there, the science is not black and white and there is no absolutes, it is still very clear what the optimal diet is for humans. It's just not a single dietary brand, a single dietary label that we've met up and rather is this sort of set of characteristics. And, and thus there is some nuance there. Um, and, and, and accordingly, I will have guests that come on and, and, you know, there may be, you know, little points of, of contention or things that we'll discuss that maybe we see a little differently, but overall we see things uh, fairly similarly. You didn't digress at all because you kind of set up for my next question, which is based around, so how can we, because we've got so much information being thrown at us, whether it's social media, news articles, you name it, like this vast amounts of information there for people to to glean from. So how do we learn to trust the science if science is always evolving and changing? Sure. So the first thing that I think is really important for people to understand, really important, is, Jay, not all science is created equal. Not all science is equal. And this is what, what really trips people up online. And I say that because we see what is called false equivalence. Yeah. What I mean by that is, is, and really anyone can go online today and share information about nutrition. Yeah. Now, and, and that's not a problem because it's, for me, it's not about someone's qualifications. It's about where are they getting that evidence from? Mm. How, what, what is that evidence and where does it sit in the evidence hierarchy? And that's what I mean by not all science is equal. Hear me out on this. So we have, essentially, you could imagine it like a pyramid. And, and this is a hierarchy uh, of evidence that essentially speaks to what is the most reliable uh, validated research to guide our public health recommendations about nutrition, mm. sitting at the very bottom, which is the weakest, least uh, reliable, least validated research or piece of evidence is anecdotal evidence and expert opinion. Yeah. That's that's if, if I just rocked up to social media and did a post about my personal experience, let's say I adopted an all meat diet, I felt this way, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not validated. We don't know what else I did in my life. We don't know uh, anything about myself in terms of uh, was I, am I healthy? Do I have a chronic disease? Um, you know, we really have no idea of independently knowing what was the effect of adding all meat to that person's diet. Also, it's a very short-term thing. Mm -hmm. We have no way of understanding, well, was the addition of all meat to Simon's diet, was that, how did that play out over years? You know, mm -hmm. he's jumping on social media and talking about this and how great he feels now, but how's that going to pan out in five, 10 years? Is he going to develop colorectal cancer? Mm -hmm. Now, so that's down the bottom, very weak, although we see it all the time on social media. We see people screaming about it very loudly, all diets, all diets. It could be the vegan diet. It could be a low carb diet. It could be a paleo diet. It could be a carnivore diet all sides 
yeah. anecdotes. Take them with a grain of salt. Mm. Now, uh, at the same level is is case studies, or, or perhaps some people may say they're sort of one one step up. A case study again is very weak evidence. It's, it's an n equals one. Let's say that uh, here's an example of a case study, a great case study that has been that has been shared widely on social media to to scare people from consuming soy. This is a great one. So there's a guy and he decides to consume 12 serves of soy a day. He's having all soy soy uh, milk, 12 cups of soy milk a day. And he over time develops some breast tenderness. Now, the, there's been a theory for a while uh, out there or or definitely uh, some some sort of rhetoric online that soy causes feminizing effects in females. Okay, so this guy has the 12 serves a day of soy. He develops these this breast tenderness. Some people could call that feminizing effect. And uh, he goes and sees his GP. And his GP writes all this down and says, okay, uh, I don't know what else this guy's done in his life. I'm just taking a patient history here. It's not a controlled trial. We actually do not know anything other than what this guy's saying. Saying he had a lot of soy. He's got breast tenderness. Uh, we're going to tell him to stop drinking the 12 cups of soy. Uh, I'm not sure who would have 12 cups of anything, any individual Extreme. food in one day. Uh, <laughs> it, I'm sure if you did that with dairy, you'd also have some problems. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and over time, his breast tenderness went away. So the doctor thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's write that up as a case study. And so that's like an N equals one, one person case study. It's not very validated. We don't know what else that person was doing in their life. It is interesting. It's, it's hypothesis generating. Absolutely. And, and that's where case studies uh, come in handy because sometimes they might set up more rigorous levels of science to be conducted. Mm. But they really shouldn't. They really shouldn't be used on social media and to scare people of soy, unless that's the highest level of evidence we have. If yeah. that was the highest level of evidence we have, then okay. But as we step up the evidence hierarchy, the next level is observational research. This is looking at populations of people who who naturally are just out there living, and they're eating in a certain way. And we're looking at their health outcomes. And so it's not a clinical intervention where you're controlling for absolutely everything. And the only difference between groups is say one group's consuming soy and one's not. Uh, but it still gives you a good overall idea. And there are ways of using statistics to, to do as best as possible to try and see the independent of effect of a particular food or nutrient. Yeah. And then, and then once we go above that level is randomized controlled trials. I realize that this is a long explanation, but I'll tie it all up at the end. At the top, you've got randomized controlled trials. This is where I, let's say as a nutrition scientist, I say, I want to perform a study and I want to look at when you feed male soy products, what happens to their hormone levels? Mm. I want to do this in a clinical trial situation. So the only difference between the two groups is the soy. Everything else is exactly the same. Mm. And I want to randomize people at the start to make sure we have we we remove any bias and difference between the groups. Now, that is the most rigorous, that's considered the gold standard level of science because we can truly see the independent of effect of some sort of dietary intervention or supplement, or in the case of pharmaceuticals, a drug, for example. If you go above that, there is one other step at the very top of the hierarchy is what we call a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. That's when you, you grab a whole lot of clinical trials, for example, that are all looking at the same thing. Let's say 40 trials all looked at the effect of adding soy in a male's diet on their hormones. Well, what could be really interesting is to get those 40 trials, put them together, summate them and see what the overall effect is. Because if one or two of those trials had some form of bias or error, at least if we're bringing 40 together, we, we have a more of a chance of eliminating any, any likelihood of chance. 
Now, on that topic of soy and men's hormones, we have a, a meta-analysis of 38 clinical trials. So this is 38 different clinical trials, all lasting from about a month to a year. Get people, two groups, exactly the same, except for one's consuming soy. And let's look at their hormone levels. Let's look at estrogen. Let's look at testosterone. And this, this is in humans as well. Mm -hmm. And and this meta-analysis clearly shows that there is no negative effect of soy on male hormone levels. And, and so tying this all up, where I'm going with this is, as I said at the start, not all science is equal, but you can find that case study, that N equals one case study written about widely on the internet in blogs. You'll see people posting about it on social media. And not only that, I didn't mention animal studies is down at the, basically at the same level as case study. You'll see people grabbing uh, mice studies. And these are studies, again, which can be very interesting and hypothesis generating. But in the case of the example of soy, there are lots of soy uh, studies with mice where they feed the mice soy in levels that humans would never consume in one day. Mm. I'm talking 15, 30 serves of soy a day equivalent if you were to look at a comparison in body size. And, and so the exposure which is a very in, important thing in nutrition because we're not just talking about the food. It's, it's what's the actual amount yeah. uh, is very critical. And, and, and so you'll see people online pointing to the case study on soy, the N equals one case study or the mice studies. And what they're doing is completely overlooking more rigorous validated research in humans. And that is what we call cherry picking. Mm. That is the definition of cherry picking. Cherry picking is going out of your way to look past high, more vigorous, highly vigorous research to lower, weaker research because it supports your narrative. That is not science. That is marketing. And, and so if I was to wrap all of this up, because often I, I, I'm, I'm asked after this by people, they say, well, that's really interesting. And I completely understand what you're saying, but I'm a businessman or I'm a mom of three kids or I'm a real estate agent. Yeah. I don't have time to, to, to decipher all of the research. And if you're listening and that's you, I get it. And I don't believe that people should have to have a high level of nutritional literacy to make sense of all of this. If, if we are expecting that, of the entire public, we will never turn around the chronic disease epidemic that we are currently faced with. Yeah. That is not the answer. So, so then what's a simple way for people to understand where does the science actually lie? Like where can they go and, and what can they trust? And I could easily just plug my book here, but I won't do that. And, and I won't do that because I think there are, I want, I don't want people listening this to just automatically trust me. What I want you to do is go above me, go above me to the consensus guidelines, the consensus guidelines that are out there by the uh, American College of Cardio Cardiology, the American Cancer Society, the endocrinology guidelines, the Eat Lancet guidelines, even Ca Health Canada, Canada's new dietary guidelines, all of those five guidelines. These are consensus statements, particularly the medical ones I just reeled off, like the American College of Cardiology, the American Cancer Society, the um, American Endocrinology Society. The really neat thing about these is that they, they go out and they get experts, but it's not expert opinion. What they do is they get these experts who are scientists and MDs, all of whom have different personal diets. Yeah, They remove ideology. And they say to this group, okay, come together in a boardroom and evaluate the evidence using the evidence hierarchy. Use the evidence hierarchy. Let's not use the social media approach of grabbing my studies and, and case studies and, mm -hmm. and misrepresenting the science because what we want to do is actually improve public health here. What is the best available science we have? And then let's create guidelines. Mm -hmm. Let's create guidelines that truly inform the public how they can eat and what changes they can make to the food on their plate to improve their health. And if you look at those guidelines, all of them, different 
different groups of committees, all of them are consistent. They are so consistent. It's crazy. It's mind blowing that we're still having all of these debates about what a healthy diet is. All of them are creating a compelling case for people adopting more plant-based approaches, eating more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. It's consistent in all of them. And so I can give you the links to those. You can pop those into the show notes. They, they are openly accessible to everyone and uh, they're not overly scientific. So they're, they're quite uh, accessible in, in terms of readability. And uh, if, if people are looking for a very trusted source of information, that's where I'd be starting. Mm. And then once you've looked at those, and that won't take you that long, question anyone on social media or any book you read that is recommending things against those consensus papers. Where are they? Why are they coming to that conclusion that is different to all of these scientific consensus papers? Where, where is their evidence? Where is their opinion being formed? And uh, you can, depending on how much time you have, some people I would say, if you're noticing people are recommending against the consensus, I just wouldn't follow those people's recommendations and I would move on and find other people who are giving recommendations in line with the consensus. If someone had more time, you could ask that person where their opinion is coming from and, and have a look at the evidence and check out if it's a, a, a my study or, or whatnot. But um, bottom line in short, those consensus guidelines, that, that is, is where I'd point people for a very impartial uh, review of nutrition and uh, a way of understanding what is true and what is not. That was a fascinating explanation. I was like trying to, <laughs> trying to like digest everything. I'm going to have to go back over my own show and then write more notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please do send me those, those research papers so I can link them to people. And I will say, you may not be happy with plugging your book, but I'm certainly happy with plugging your book <laughs> on the show. Go and read it. It is a fascinating read. If you did enjoy Simon explain that little bit, he goes further into the book. And I wasn't going to ask you, you know, that question that you were explaining earlier. Uh, I don't have time, that sort of thing. One thing that I was fascinated by is you are well-researched. You do know the facts because you've studied it for a long period of time. You've written a book about it, or most, a lot of, um, yeah. Where did your fascination come from to study all this in the first place? And you do have a pretty interesting story about your dad. So uh, can you please share that? Yeah. So my interest in science comes from my dad and from as early as I can remember. I think I can sometimes think back to when I was about five or six. That's as far back as it goes these days. But I remember uh, coffee tables, cars, desks at home, kitchen table, always on top of these were piles and piles of scientific studies. Mm. They, were, they were stapled. They were highlighted. There was notes on them. And this, these were studies that my dad was reviewing or writing or had written himself. And, and he's, my dad's a doctor on the academic side of things. He's a professor now and has been very interested in how our blood vessels work. And I won't go into too much detail, but he's contributed greatly to, to the research looking at what is known as vascular stiffness, which is a, a part of the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease, our number one uh, leading cause of death in Western countries. Mm -hmm. And so really, I had this deep appreciation for science and the scientific method from a very, very young age. And, and that was, was something that ended up inspiring me to pursue science uh, at university through the two different degrees that I've done. Uh, when I was 15, there was a, a particular day that really planted a seed for everything that I'm doing today. I don't know that I would be doing what I am today if it wasn't for this day, or at least I wouldn't necessarily have as, as much meaning behind what I'm doing. And, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, towards the end of this story. But I grew up in Melbourne and 
uh, my dad and my brother and, and I on weekends, we would often go out exploring different, different areas of the country and particularly wine regions. My dad had this real interest in not, not just the wine itself, but really getting to know the owners of the vineyards and uh, learning from them about their craft and going to the small ones and seeing these people who were so passionate about what they were doing and giving them the time to 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 explain that and 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 to learn from them and so these were uh, awesome weekends great experiences uh you know very memorable days that i i, I still value uh tremendously today and uh on this particular day it was just my dad and my brother we were out in the yarra valley uh beautiful wine district outside of melbourne and we'd spent a great day together uh we were driving back home my dad had a an old mgb you might be familiar with those are british uh sort of classic british car convertible little white thing and we had the roof down it was a balmy dusk 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 uh time of the afternoon and uh my dad started to to grimace i could see he was uncomfortable as he was driving and i inquired and he said that he was experiencing some pain in his chest and he he assured me though that it wasn't anything serious and it was just like a bit of tightness uh and uh it would be fine and we, we got home and cooked dinner and uh i inquired again and he reassured me that it was it was okay and so i really didn't think too much of it and and headed off to bed and a little while after i heard quite a bit of noise in the kitchen and cluttering around and it was enough to wake me up and and so i thought i better go and and see if dad's okay in the back of my mind i had had remembered he wasn't feeling amazing uh and I went out and found my dad on on his knees, uh, out of breath. He was very pale, and and had a had a real sense of fear, you know. And it was probably the first time that I'd ever seen my dad express fear, and kind of looked uh, helpless. And he was actually scrambling to grab the phone to call triple zero uh, for any international listeners. That's our 911 and he had called them and like they often do they said is there anyone else there that can better explain what's happening as i said he was he was quite out of breath and so i was the only one there with him and i took the phone and explained what was happening and what had happened a couple of hours earlier sort of symptoms and 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 they said well based on where you're located we were in an area called king lake uh, you're a long way away from the nearest hospital. We, we need to send a, an ambulance, uh, a helicopter ambulance, I should say. And that kind of scared me thinking, wow, this is so serious. They need to send a helicopter. Uh, and so they did. And everything at that, that time was moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of fear. Uh, you know, I was only 15. I wasn't really able to process what was happening. Um, and they came and they scooped him up off the floor, put him on a stretcher, attached him to oxygen, were taking vital signs and I couldn't fit in the helicopter. So they said, you can trail by road in an ambulance and you'll meet your, your dad at the hospital. And so before I knew it, he was being flown off and only hours earlier, he was completely healthy, completely fine. And I should mention he was 41 years old, which is not much older than I am today, uh, which just is, is just crazy to think about. And, and also he had prior to that, he was on no medications, had no ill health, no diagnosis. This was out of nowhere. And, and so I did make my way to the hospital. By that time I'd called my mother and my brother we were at our country home and, and my mother and brother were in the city. So they, uh, they, they came and met us and there was a long, what felt like a very long period waiting to find out, was he going to be okay? What was happening at this stage? We really didn't even know what was happening. We had our suspicions that it was a heart attack, 
uh, but it wasn't sort of uh, made made uh, that wasn't sort of uh, made formal to us. And and we waited, and the cardiologist came out and and told us, explained to us that that dad had had a, a serious heart attack, and they'd managed to stabilize him and thankfully with the helicopter and the assistance of of western medicine in our hospital system they were able to save his life which was the most important thing for us uh certainly at the time by a long way and uh you know a day a day later we sort of had a bit of a family meeting with the cardiologist and by this time was with my father sort of beside the hospital bed and he'd taken a full history by that stage and and he said to to my brother and I, look, you know, I know that pointing to me, you're only 15, and my brother was 17, maybe 18. Then uh, I know that you're you're only teenagers, but as you get a little bit older and, and become adults, you'll need to be screened for cardiovascular disease because it runs in families. And looking back, that's not bad advice in itself because he's right it does run in families and it is sensible to get screened if you have a family history of it. But unfortunately the conversation stopped then that's where the conversation stopped. And, and I wish it had have gone further because it was, it was not for another 10 years or so until I had had fully started to appreciate nutrition science and the role that nutrition plays in our health and, and getting right across the evidence that I realized that you know he was right cardiovascular disease our top killer in this country certainly runs in families mm -hmm. but by and large it's running in families because we adopt the same lifestyles not because of genetics yes genetics do play a role but we have we have fairly good science now that suggests around 20 percent of our health fate is based on genetics and 80 percent is to do with our lifestyles so look, we may have been dealt a bad genetic card. And for me, that that might place me at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But it's rather than than the sort of disempowering feeling of just accepting that that is your fate, and that, hey, your dad had a heart attack at 41. So what's what's to say that's not going to be the same as you, you know, and, and uh, rather than accepting that it's very empowering to understand that, well, hey, Actually, we have far more control than what our, our our genetics have to say through our lifestyle, through our diet, through our exercise, et cetera. And actually, when you look at the risk factors to to that that increased risk of all chronic disease and premature death globally, great study, 2017 Global Burden of Disease Study, looked at exactly this. And and it showed that the number one risk, the number one risk for chronic disease and early loss of life is poor diet. And so when you when you think about it like that and you put it into perspective, it's it's a it's a very empowering feeling and it's something that I use now to really give more meaning to 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 everything that I'm doing to the book that I wrote. My message being to people, don't wait for pain to change your lifestyle. Mm. You can do a number of things today you can make a number of tweaks and nudges to your lifestyle. Back to what we said at the start, it doesn't have to be executed perfectly. But there are a number of things that you can do to step into the right direction that will reduce your risk of these diseases that we've normalized in our society with the ultimate aim. The ultimate aim and the ultimate purpose of what I'm doing is to help you live healthier for longer. That way you can just keep doing more of what you love to do, yeah. you know, whether that's spending time with your family or pursuing your career or whatever that that may be. You sort of touched on the gen genetic uh, question that it have for you, so I won't ask you that. But I will say uh, that I have been dealt a bad genetic card, so to speak, with my health. And one of those things I do have is an abnormally large heart, and they've got a heart murmur as well. And then I was um i went to a specialist and they did diagnose that my heart skips a beat there was like a, i'm prone to infection around it mm. um and they found that when i suffered a panic attack so number of number of health issues that's just one of the 
the giant list that I could share with you, Simon, but I won't won't share it with you. Uh, so I had I do need to take care of my diet. I am very health conscious, uh, especially with the genetics things. But I've always been interested about you know the or more recently now uh, shifting the diet and towards a more plant based approach, especially you know, after reading your book, it makes a lot of sense to me. Now I'm not like going to put a title on it and say that I'm, I'm going vegan or anything like that, because I didn't really do the same thing when I was eating meat or I used to have a, a used to make a joke of this. I used to say I have a freedom diet, you know, and that's before all the health craziness recently started. <laughs> um, but now it's sort of, I'm more aware and more conscious. Like I've got all the information in front of me, it's about actually now doing the practical application to it and saying, okay, here's all the foods that I should be eating to help my health. Um, and I, I'm, I'm interested from your perspective on, okay, what's worse? Is it meat or sugar? <laughs> well, let me, let me break that down. Uh, I actually, I don't think either of those are inherently bad let me let me explain uh and that might sound odd the the question it's very hard in isolation to say is a single food good or bad or a single nutrient good or bad and and this is why there are so there's so much confusion through the media because jay we have to ask what's the exposure amount that you're talking about yeah uh compared to what what are we displacing from the diet or replacing yeah that's 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 critical right um and and so is, is, is a little bit of say sugar in your coffee, uh, a problem in the right dietary pattern. I don't think it is, but is the fact that 42% of the Australians, uh, calories are coming from ultra processed foods that are loaded in sugar, salt and fat a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so I don't think that sugar is inherently the issue. I think the, the problem with our diet overall if i was to, to describe it is that we we are consuming far too many ultra processed foods now they happen to be loaded in sugar but they're also loaded in fat they're loaded in salt they're loaded in a lot of other things we seem to want to just demonize the sugar but let's be honest 42 percent of the calories are coming from these ultra processed foods why because they're hyper palatable and food scientists are making them hyper palatable to reach that bliss point where we just that they're irresistible and they are, they are damn delicious. I'll put that on the record. They are delicious. They've done well, hats off to them. But the problem is that combination of ingredients is, is so attractive that it's crowding out all of these fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds that, that really do re reward us. They re reward our gut microbiome. They reduce inflammation. They help us reduce blood pressure. They imp improve our blood glucose control. They lower our risk of disease. Now, so, so that's what I would say about sugar. I think we need to contextualize it. Uh, and, and also I would add to that, that the sugar and fruit is of course, has been unfairly demonized. Yeah. Absolutely. We can't be equating jelly beans to, to strawberries and berries and, and, and whatnot. Uh, they have a very different effect on the body. Uh, the, you know, we know the health outcomes of eating more fruits uh, is great risk reductions, even for things like type two diabetes. Yeah. Now, uh, to do with to 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 tackle the meat side of the question, right now the the average Australian gets about seventy to eighty five percent of their protein from animal protein. Yeah. That's that that is a problem. We're getting too much of our protein from animal protein. Absolutely. Uh, if if we were though just to tackle the forty two percent of calories from ultra processed foods and and just put the meat to the side for the moment, everyone would improve their health. Now that's not something you hear many people talking about. Why? Because it's 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 not as sexy as having the animal versus plant debate, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's something that we all agree on. No matter what side of the fence you sit on, we need to return to whole foods. We have to return to whole foods. That's such a big thing that has changed in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. And and I write about in the book. At some point in time, that shift to ultra processed food, long shelf life, it served us. We didn't have the logistics and the the uh, food accessibility that we have today, and so having these preserved foods, long shelf life, uh, this helped us 
get worked through periods of malnutrition. And it helped us tackle these different types of diseases of that day, things like scurvy mm. and beriberi and pellagra, which were nutrient deficiency diseases. Today in developed countries, we're not faced with that. We're faced with overconsumption and, and these lifestyle diseases. And so we kind of fixed one problem uh, 100 years ago and unknowingly created another. Yeah. Uh, and and unfortunately, the developing countries are now going through the same thing because they're following our footsteps. And and so as they become wealthier, they're looking to us and they see the fact that Coca-Cola or Nestle and all of these big transnational companies have infiltrated our, our countries and they're following us. And, and unfortunately, what we will see in the next 20 to 50 years, unless something changes, these countries, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, will just match ours. Mm. Uh, so that's that's kind of, I, I think, the most important thing for me to tackle there. But in terms of meat, there are there are some important things for us to consider. Uh, it's a, a top source of saturated fat, which we know is is not great for cardiovascular health. And, and really, uh, often we hear about the paleo and the sort of ancestral diet and and it's sort of glamorized as this very meat heavy caveman style diet now i've spoken to many uh evolutionary anthropologists and i've read a lot of the research and i can tell you that anyone who says there was one single paleo diet has not read the the research the diet varied across the world it depended on season geographical location some areas it was more animals less plants and some it was the the reverse and and what it showed was really the our ability to survive on a wide range of foods and and that ancestral piece is about survival and about reproduction they had different goals to us today today we don't want to just survive and reproduce we we also thanks to modern western medicine we we are able to live till 70 80 90 and we want to do that in good health and so we have different goals to sort of homo erectus uh also the meat of that time, which I think is the biggest consideration, uh, you know, woolly mammoth. We know that the style of meat, uh, it was a very lean, very low in saturated fat, probably more like antelope or venison today, it's sort of gamey meats, maybe even kangaroo. Uh, but it's very different to, to this beef off cows and lamb and uh, even chicken. And so to, to, to suggest that it is approximating what they ate a long time ago is, is not the case. And, and quite clearly, we know from science looking at modern humans, which I believe is more reliable and accurate than speculating on what people ate 10,000 years ago who had different goals, all of the modern research we have shows that these plant predominant style dietary patterns lead to better long-term health. Uh, and so some of them do include modest amounts of meat. Absolutely. Ideally, it's it's lean cuts of meat coming from animals that are fed a native uh, diet um, or wild caught sustainable fish foods like that, uh, as opposed to the sort of fatty cuts and processed meats like salamis and, and bacon, et cetera. So look, as I said earlier, there is a little bit of nuance. Uh, you know, I think a healthy diet could have some of those foods within a plant predominant dietary pattern. And we'd be splitting hairs to say, is that diet healthier or less healthier than let's say a completely 100% plant exclusive whole food uh, diet. And I also don't like the fact that in our modern world, all the resources that we do have available to us, that the healthy section is far more expensive than the unhealthy section. And I think it should be the other way around, just so it can entice people more to buy healthy food and stay away from the unhealthy stuff. But I don't think we'll get there, do you think? What you're speaking to is perhaps the most important public health uh, area for us to address if we're going to turn chronic disease around and you're talking to the food environment. Yeah. And, and so I, I wrote my book knowing that I can help an individual, but something that, that I've, I've developed a lot of appreciation for, and I, I perhaps was probably a little bit uninformed and maybe even incorrect on this some years ago was it's, it's, it's not, it's not, right to think that we can write a book or just tell people to say 
uh, adopt a, a vegan diet and expect the public to do that well. We we actually need uh, our food environment just to show up in the right way for people to make the healthy decisions. We can't expect everyone to develop nutritional literacy as we spoke about earlier. And so what we want is the default diet for Australians out there, people who are going to the grocery stores every day and they're not spending their time listening to, to podcasts and reading books just to make the healthier decision more often. And there, are, you know, I, I, I removed quite a bit from my book that I couldn't fit that I, I wish I was able to, to sort of, uh, retain in there, but, uh, I can reel off a couple of, of, of interesting points, uh, for you that sort of speaks to this, you know, the healthy products in a grocery store are on sale around half the amount of time as unhealthy products that the, the unhealthy products are promoted, you know, twice as, as frequently. Yeah. And, and we know that uh, things like in Sydney, if you look at a, a typical uh, train route to school, kids are, are seven times more likely to see an unhealthy advertisement for unhealthy food than they are for healthy food. So that's strategic. We have these transnational food companies. I mentioned a few of them before, Nestle, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, uh, Mars, et cetera. And they're creating this environment. We know in Perth, uh, within 500 meters of schools, 74% of all foods promoted are unhealthy discretionary foods, which are at with which are which are formulated with added salt, sugar, and or oil. We know that just across our country in general, all of the food outlets, be it grocery stores, be it service stations, be it school kiosks, be it hospitals, 49% of packaged food, pretty much half of all food available, is considered unhealthy. We know that kids on their uh, on their mobile phones see about 100 unhealthy food advertisements per week. We know that when they're on their computers, they're seeing on average 10 unhealthy food advertisements per hour. We know that 44% of food in hospitals, 44% of all food in Australian hospitals is categorized as unhealthy. And so... All of this speaks to the same point you were making. We just have a food environment that is set up for people to fail. And, and how is that going to change? Well, it, that, that boils down to legislation. Yeah. It boils down to, to our government stepping up and prioritizing health and realizing the, the, the economic opportunity of a healthier population. You know, a healthier, happier population is 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 huge for the economy and it will reach a tipping point where the the government realizes that the the burden of disease is just too large to continue to carry and and i think we're starting to see great examples in other countries the united kingdom they banned junk food from grocery checkouts <laughs> it's been banned so now when you're standing there waiting to pay you're not faced with the mars bar and the snickers and, and all of these foods that have been strategically placed there for an impulse purchase mm -hmm. uh and we see taxes on on sugar in various countries on on the the ultra processed foods that are full of sugar or sugar sweetened beverages like coca-cola and they're working and or seem to be working from from early reports um and, and, you know, to your point, I think the healthier foods need to become cheaper. If we're going to tax and make these other foods uh, less accessible at the same time, then the healthy option needs to be, to be more affordable for people. And, and you know, the, the sort of economic or socioeconomic disparity out there is something that is not spoken about enough. It is hard to eat healthy if you are from a lower socioeconomic population. Yeah, and and struggling to make ends meet, and we can't shy away from that, and and so, uh, you know, I'm I'm a big believer in individuals where they can making the changes they can, but governments do need to to step in, and and this is also comes back to one of the the main reasons why in my book it's not about perfection, and and part of that is I understand that individuals need to look at the information, connect with it, and make the changes that are right for them, and part of that is understanding their family, their budget, and and uh, their sort of uh, means to be able to make the changes. And also supporting local produce as well. Our farmers, they need, they need help. But usually what happens is they don't get the support that they need from 
fellow Australians, uh, they usually go towards the protest <laughs> foods. So I think you speaking about this quite heavily is needed and it, whatever way I can do to help support you in doing that, um, because the book is also about saving the planet. It's not just about, you know, the, the, all the, all the, um, you know, the, the, the advice that you give and the strategic strategies, everything like that. It's just, you know, we've got to do better <laughs> is what I'm saying. And I just appreciate your message uh, a lot, Simon. Um, two final questions for you, if you don't mind, because I just saw the time and I've loved this conversation, by the way, going to have to get you on for a part two later on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it too, mate. So many more questions for you, man. But what has since we're on the topic of food, what has been the weirdest food combination you've ever tried? Gosh, that's a you might have stumped me there. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, look, I, I I can't recall a, a particular dish, but I've I've done a lot of travel through sort of Southeast Asia and uh you know, I've tried a bunch of, of, of weird dishes in my time, maybe even South America, uh, in, in Peru, I spent a bit of time. I can't remember the, the, the weirdest sort of combination. Uh, but I think it's, for me, it's, it's, it's usually when dessert has a mix of the sweet and the savory. Um, I usually find a little interesting, um, but I'm, I'm a very open minded person and, and, and love trying new foods and, and whatnot. So, um, I've certainly tried my fair share of, of weird dishes, but one in particular is not coming to mind. Have you ever tried, okay, this is one of my favorite combinations, peanut butter and ice cream plus with chips. I haven't done that. Have it's unhealthy as heck, <laughs> <laughs> but still, it, it tastes absolutely glorious. There's a a place in Leichhardt that I I love called Peanut Butter Bar. Um, if you do get a chance, they do have some like plant based options there, which I mm. I like too. But for the most part, peanut butter, chips, and ice cream, game changer. <laughs> yeah, well, that actually one has come to mind, and this this. Uh, this is not something I'm proud of. This was when I was a kid. McDonald's used to be a, a real uh, regular uh, after sport and it was the place people would have their birthday parties. And yep. I think that's the case for for many kids in Australia and perhaps even still today. Might be changing, uh, but definitely was when I grew up. And I, I do remember there was the, uh, the McFlurry and people uh, dipping the chicken nuggets into the McFlurry. So again, not healthy and uh, an interesting combination. <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. <laughs> um, all right. So where can people find you, Simon, connect with you, buy your new book and learn more about you? Actually, one more has come to mind. Yes, go for it, it, please. Have you, have you ever had a, uh, I think it's called a spider? Yes, yes. It, it's ice cream with Soft like coconut ice cream. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Mum used to make that for me. Gosh, I'm not sure how healthy that was. Uh, so the book, uh, yeah, it's called The Proof is in the Plants. Uh, it's out now in bookstores across Australia. You can find it also online, like Booktopia and Amazon. Uh, support your local bookstores if you can, particularly if they're in country regions um, that have been severely affected, uh, I guess more than a couple of years now with the bushfires affecting those those regions and then uh covid uh, of course affecting travel so uh big big believer in supporting those local bookstores if you can uh and yeah it's been it's been going amazing it was the the number one selling non-fiction book in australia in the first week it came out which was uh very very surprising um but you know, it was nice to see after spending three or so years writing it. Uh, and if you want to connect with me, uh, if you're not sick of listening to my voice, you can listen, come over and uh, join the Plant Proof uh, podcast conversations. We'd love to have you there. And uh, on social media, I'm most active on Instagram uh, at plant underscore proof. And I have to say, man, you did get published by the number one publisher in the world, Penguin Random House. Congratulations for that amazing achievement like that is not an easy thing to do either so well done and you know the book is well deserving to go bestseller i am surprised that it still hasn't gone new york times bestseller yet but i'm sure that's coming just around the corner 
So keep it up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Know you. It's um, it's 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 uh, I actually found it last week. It, it'll be on shelf uh, in America November one. So that's that's the date when it actually launches in America. So uh, for the moment. Uh, if anyone's listening and they're in America, you can buy it uh, online on Book Depository. I, sh- I should have said that, but um, it's only on shelf at the moment in Australia. Get in there, man. Get in there. So, Simon, this is my final question I ask everyone at the end. It's my all-time favorite question. It's a hypothetical one, so I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able <laughs> to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Oh, I just want, I want it to, I want I want to see laughter and the light side and the, the fun and the connection, uh, those moments with, the friends and family are, are the most important thing. And, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd love for it to, to capture that and, and, and the effect that I've had on the people around me, I think would be, uh, an, a nice thing to see before, uh, leaving this life. Perfect send off message. Simon Hill. Thank you so much, man, for coming on the Storybox podcast and sharing your stories, wisdom and advice. Thanks Jay. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, yeah, Look forward to uh, doing it again sometime in the future, hopefully.